some notes. Um, homework one is due in the lab this week. It's posted. I will post homework two after class today. They will go over it. I've given them an example to do that's a whole lot like the homework, but not the homework. It's basically identical to the homework, but not the homework itself. And so hopefully there'll be some value in attending. Um, and so they'll go over homework two tomorrow, and they'll be due the next week, and that's the standard procedure, except for exam week, and we'll deal with that when we come to it. Great. Okay, today starts to get a little bit harder. We're going to start something new. We're going to jump right into it. The next two, three days, we'll be doing heteroscedasticity. First talk about what it is, then we'll talk about how to diagnose it. We'll give several tests, five tests, five separate tests. We'll have recommendations on which to use in which situation. No test is dominant in all situations of the ones we'll talk about. Some are more robust to certain things, some are more robust to others. So depending upon the situation determines the test you'll want to conduct. Then we'll talk about, suppose you use your test to discover that you have heteroscedasticity, how do you fix it? And again, we'll have four, maybe five different fixes, and which fixes apply will depend upon the nature of the problem you're dealing with. So we'll have to give you some recommendations on how to know which fix to use in which time periods. And we'll make that rather cookbook rather than theoretical, so you can just look it up and say, oh, if I see this, I do this. If I see this, I do that. We'll try to fill, it, fill in the theoretical underpinnings, but my goal, if nothing else, is to take a cookbook approach to a lot of these procedures and say, look, if you see this, you implement this procedure, and it's going to work, and here's why it works, and, and so on. So, so that's, that's the approach we're going to be taking. So let's, let's get to it. Um, heteroscedasticity <coughs> unequal variances is essentially what we're trying to say there. One of the assumptions that we've made, we've assumed that the errors are, did you cover IID? In, in 420, what's IID mean? Independent and identically distributed. So one of the strong assumptions that we make is that the error terms are independently and identically distributed. So we assume that they're IID. I'll probably use that term again, so let me just sketch it out here. Independently and identically distributed. Independently, when they're not independently distributed, that's when we have what's called serial correlation. The error today is related to the error yesterday. The errors are not independent. We're not going to deal with that problem next. We will deal with it in, 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 many, in plenty of detail, but not, not today. So we want to look at this identically distributed property that we've assumed. Now, if that's true, we know, well, along with all the other assumptions, that Gauss, the Gauss-Markov theorem I, uh, guarantees that OLS is optimal. The optimal linear estimate is blue. So, but what happens if that's not true? And one way it could not be true is through heteroscedasticity, and that means when the variance is not the same for all observations. So the identical that we've assumed is that all of the EI are distributed normal, or are distributed with mean zero and variance sigma squared. We don't mean necessarily that it's normal. If you want to think of it being normal, that's just fine. But they don't always follow a normal distribution. For intuitions, thinking normal won't hurt you one bit. Might even help. But anyway, um, so that's the assumption. Now notice there's no eyes here. There are no eyes. So remember, we have a bunch of observations. There's, there's a y1, an x1, y2, x2, y3, x3. Each one has an error, right? So if we were just going to run the regression yi equals b1 plus b2 xi plus bi, we'd have a bunch of data in our spreadsheet. We'd have the yi's here, the xi's here. There'd be a bunch of data. 
Each one of these has an error. We don't know this data. It's not in our spreadsheet. We, we don't know the EIs. We only know the Ys and X. But implicitly, it's there. And every one of these errors has the same variance. So all of these have the same variance if they're homoscedastic. You with me? If not, stop me. We'll, 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 we'll get on the same. We want to start off understanding the problem at least. And so these variances differ over time. They're not the same. The standard assumption there's no I here. When there's a problem, we'll say that the EI are distributed with mean zero and variance sigma squared I. Every one of these has a different variance. Now, there could be two groups of variances. It doesn't matter as long as they're unequal in the, in the data, across the data. Graphically, the way to see that, and again, apologies in advance for my artistic skills. I'll do the best I can. If this is the true line in the XI, YI example, I'm just using a two-variable example for illustrative purposes. All of this extends without loss of generality to multiple variable situations. But anyway, we've assumed, we've got the scatter plot of data. We've assumed that all of the, the errors are distributed normally, say, and they have the same variance. So this distribution looks identical. If I could say control C, control, control V, control V, control V, control V, I would. Okay? Because they're identical. So I just copy that one, paste, 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 paste. So I'd have the right distribution for every error term. When it's heteroscedasticity, I can't paste this one because they're not the same. So every one of these normal distributions, I'm intending to look identical. And that's how the errors are distributed around this line. So that the spread of the errors is identical. If you just look at the spread of these things and measure it at any point in time, it's going to look the same. Under heteroscedasticity, as we noted the first day, that assumption is violated. I'll draw a particular sort of cone shape pattern here, but it doesn't have to be this pattern. It's just a nice one for intuition. It's just a nice one to sort of understand what's going on. It can be any pattern. It's just not basically that they're distributed, say, with 90% probability within those two lines. So with, with heteroscedasticity, you might start with a small variance here and end up with a great big one way out here. So that the distribution of your error terms tends to expand over time. It's small here, it gets bigger and bigger. So those sort of 90% confidence lines might look like that. Your spread is getting, there's one, your spread is getting larger and larger over time. And it could look like a gopher and a snake. It doesn't matter, you know, what it looks like. Does that make sense? You can have a little bulge here. There's the gopher and there's the snake. Um, it wouldn't make any difference at all. You'd still have heteroscedasticity as long as there's unequal variances somewhere. Oh, less is no longer going to be your optimal estimate. Okay, so that's the nature of the problem. Um, so how might this problem come about? So how might... heteroscedasticity arise.
trying to remember to write big. I keep forgetting. So I'll just follow the book's list. Uh, it's got a list of seven things. I'm going to truncate that to four or five, maybe five, because some I think are exactly the same. But anyway, um, the first one they list is learning. So this might happen in a time series of data. You've got some process where um, over time you learn to do things better. And so initially, there, there, there's some behavioral assumption underneath the, 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 the process. And initially, there's a lot of error around the truth because you haven't learned how to do it yet. So there's some true average and you're playing the newest video game and you get killed every time right away because you just haven't figured it out. <coughs> As you get better and better and better, those errors decline over time. And so you see an error pattern that tends to look just the opposite of that. It tends to get tighter and tighter. Then you, you know, you're a golfer and you hit 48 and then you just kind of level out and that's it. You don't get any better over time. Whatever. So learning underneath can cause this problem to arise. Is that clear? The most common way, I think, is the second, which is scale variables. So you have x's. So I just broke the same piece of chalk twice of you. There is a pool going on in how many pieces I'll break today. I don't know how that counts. Um, scale variables. OK. These are things like income, wealth, sales, and so on. Suppose you're looking at a consumption function, for instance, and you're looking at the behavior in aggregates. You're a macroeconomist and you want to talk about consumption. And so you put income on this axis and consumption on this axis, and you take a cross section across the population, and you group people with very, very low incomes with people with very, very high incomes, and then you look at the relationship. CI is B1 plus B2, YI plus EI. This could be disposable income, and I, if I was doing this for realsies, I'd throw in um, other variables, but for an example, this is fine. Okay, now someone with an income of $10,000, how much could their day-to-day -day variance in consumption be? Not very large. Someone with a billion dollars might have a variance that's way higher than this person's income, or even their borrowing capacity. So even theoretically, there's no way that the variance here could match the variance there. So we expect the day-to-day -day or month-to-month -month or year-to-year -year variation of consumption among the wealthy might be far, far larger, particularly in a cross-section. Because you're going to get some, you're going to have some misers out here. And you're going to have some people who just are spendthrifts. You know, they just made it in, a, in pro sports, and they can't wait to get rid of that $2 million bonus. And so there it goes. Okay, they save nothing. Others are, got some advice before they went. And hire a financial advisor and do much better. And so the variance here can be huge in the cross section. Down here, you just can't get that kind of a variance. So you tend to see, again, this sort of pattern whenever you have scale variables involved. I use an example the first day of Walmart and Hirons or something like that. Little Y Market and Safeway. It's a little wide market still on. I used to live on Eighth and Polk, and it's a little wide market. It's probably something else now. So will learning always lead to like a decreased variance, and the scale variables always lead to increased variance. Um, learning most often does this, and scale variables most often do this. Yeah. Yes. Unless, I'm trying to think if there's any examples where things getting bigger give you a lower variance. 
I'm probably, if we thought long enough and hard enough, we can get a counterexample. But in the general case, scale variables cause the cone to open up rather than close. Three, better data collection techniques. <coughs> read that and said, yeah, that's probably not very important, downplay this one. Then I realized, wait, there is actually an important example of this in the, in the data. If you look at pre-war, post-war data in the U.S. macroeconomy, you'll see a huge variance pre-war in the data, if you look at GDP, and you'll see a much smaller variance post-war. So it looks like if you just naively took that data as factual, that the Policies that were implemented post-war, which were mostly government, you know, spending and tax policies and Keynesian types of policies, had a huge impact on stabilizing the variance of GDP. But it actually turns out that what happened is they used crappy <coughs> data collection techniques pre-war. You have a lot of variance. And this is something Christina Romer at Berkeley showed long, long ago, one of her first really important papers. And post-war, you have data that's actually much more tightly distributed. It's much better measured. And so if you've got a big heteroscedasticity problem in your data, if you just naively use it, and if you don't recognize the heteroscedasticity, you can get a wrong conclusion from it, which is that the policy was responsible for the change in the variance, rather than it's simply a matter of collecting the data better. And so, you know, if over time data collection gets better because we invented computers, that ought to uh, reduce the variance of the data. And we worry about that. So the, 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 well, yeah, we, we should worry about that. I was going to tell you all the ways they try to insulate against it in the national income accounts, but now I'm doing a macro class rather than econometrics, so that's good. Um, outliers, yeah, they can look like heteroscedasticity. Just weird observations in the data that are outliers will give you heteroscedasticity. If you look at industrial production data for the U.S. in 1974-12, there's a huge outlier. And I have a paper showing that if you don't account for that outlier, it really distorts the statistics about the relationship between money and income. That outlier by itself gives you significance. When you take that outlier out of the data, you no longer get significance. But for our purposes, outliers themselves give you heteroscedasticity or, or the appearance of heteroscedasticity in the data. It you have to be careful here. Right? It depends upon, even if you have normal distributions with the same variance, you can get a weird observation. That's not really heteroscedasticity. That's just an observation way out in the tail. And so I, I would qualify this a little bit to say an outlier driven by something other than just a, a, a draw of an observation way out in the tail. Because a draw of an observation way out in the tail is not heteroscedasticity, that's just bad luck. You've got the right underlying distribution. It's when this outlier is driven by something unusual and it sits in your data that you have a problem. Because the, the standard, uh, you've assumed a certain assumption something else is driving that, and if you haven't accounted for that, you're going to make errors. That was kind of not a very good sentence. Kind of not a very good sentence. Kind of not a very good sentence. Describing my not a very good sentence. But, um, you get what I'm saying about the outliers? There's two types of outliers. One is just bad luck, but you've got the right distribution. The other is it's drawn from some other distribution entirely. It's a problem when it's drawn from some other distribution entirely. Okay, that's three. Squeezed it too tight there, trying to. <clears throat> oh yeah, this is this is a really common way. The model <laughs> four is incorrectly specified. So take a shot of this, and I'm going to walk over there.
that's one of the more common ways. And in fact, the discovery of heteroscedasticity <coughs> is often an indication of specification errors. And so we can view heteroscedasticity tests as a way of identifying when we possibly have written down a model that's incorrect. Suppose our true model is yi is beta 1 plus beta 2 xi plus beta x2i plus beta 3 x3i plus ei. But we mistakenly, this is the omitted variable problem, we mistakenly leave this variable out of our regression. So it's in the error term. This is our new error. You can call this B prime if you want. So now your model is B1 plus B2 X2I plus E prime, EI prime. You should have music like that to do transitions. Ease the anxieties. If I take a square of this to get the variance, I'm going to get an x3i squared in the variance. Because it's the expected value of this thing squared. So I'm going to get that squared in the variance, because I don't know that. If this is a scale variable like income, what's going to happen to your variance as, you, as i gets big? It's going to blow up. If xi just moves around, it's going to cause your variance to move around. It doesn't have to blow up the way I just talked about. So if this just moves around, you're going to have a problem. So this is going to look like heteroscedasticity. That's why the specification tests are often indicative that you've left something out of your model. You've specified your model correctly and you just have random ID errors, you're fine. And when you don't see that, you should think to yourself, ah, have I left something important out? And we'll have diagnostics, but you can just plot the errors. If it looks like they're expanding, you might think to yourself, oh, I've probably left that a scale variable. So it actually points you in a direction that, that can be helpful to fix the model. And the book has, as another, you know, six and seven, there's a couple others. They say incorrect data transformations. So I take the log of a variable when I shouldn't. I square a variable when I shouldn't. I add something like that. I use 1 over x when I ought to be using x. I screw up the variable somehow. Or I have an incorrect functional form. <coughs> I try to model a highly nonlinear process with a linear model so that my errors begin expanding over time. So the truth is this, but I'm using a linear model for it. And the farther I move, the bigger the error gets between the truth. My data is going to be driven by this, and I'm trying to fit it to this line, and I'm going to get a huge, what looks like a huge heteroscedasticity problem in this model. And so incorrect functional forms can also mimic heteroscedasticity. So specification errors in general are one of the easiest ways to get the heteroscedasticity problem. I watched my video from two years ago last night to get ready, and I was really surprised that it took me 25 minutes to get to page two. I'm on page two. I guess it's not so surprising. I see why. Okay. Um, I was going to say that before class. If you ever want to like get ready for class and don't feel like reading the book in advance, just watch the videos from the last year, and you'll see me telling the same jokes. Because I watch the stupid things and then I realize, oh, I should say that again. <laughs> Last night I did the sound off because I wanted to watch the game. Wait, sir. Uh, question about number four. four. Uh, how do you know it's from another distribution, the outlier? <laughs> um, when Dang. It, when it could just be a very small probability in the distribution. What we had to do, because that's exactly the question the referees wanted to do, was look for an external event, something that happened that would explain this outlier that was unusual. And so the data itself are unlikely to tell you this. And so you have to learn about that particular question from theory 
or from, oh, you know, there was a big bombing that day somewhere, and that's why this observation is so different, because the underlying world was different that day, so the distribution was different. So you often look for major events or something unusual in an industry that might, you know, there was a tax change that suddenly everyone wanted to take advantage of, so you get, a, you get people dumping all their income that they have had in assets and because the tax rate fell, it's going to go back up again or something like that. So when you can find those events, you can often explain really big outliers in the data. And that's indicative that it's something else. But purely from the data itself, a single outlier is difficult to associate with the change in the distribution. Now, if you start seeing more and more and more and more and more as you go off in time, then you probably have a change in the underlying distribution that's permanent rather than a one-off one event. But, um, and it's unlikely to be random if they're clustering. But in general, it's hard to get that information out of the data itself, and you have to look for external sources to settle it for you. But that's a good question. Yes. Music ended, it sounds like. Okay, uh, anything else? Okay, how, what if we naively apply OLS? You know, let me just say one more thing in response to that question. This is not something you need to know, but when we do least squares, we pick the betas by minimizing the sum of squares the estimated errors squared, we find the betas that make this as small as possible. The reason we worry about outliers is we've got a squared norm here. The bigger the error is, the more influence it has on this sum of squares. And so the betas will pay a lot of attention to outliers. One reason for using a mad estimator, a minimum absolute deviation, so instead of squaring, use the absolute value is it mutes the influence, it's harder mathematically, but it mutes the influence of variables of big errors. You're no longer squaring them. And so the, the minimization problem doesn't pay as much attention to them. So this is much more robust against outliers than the other procedure, and it has a lot of the same properties. So one thing to do if you're unsure is simply to adopt a procedure that's robust against the problem and use those as your estimates. And most packages will have a mad estimator that you can just punch a button and get it. And so that, that would be another way to get around the problem. OK. New topic. Suppose we have heterosplasticity. Like, we have a problem, Houston. What if we do all of us anyway? <coughs> well, if all of us is fine, we probably would have written a whole chapter here. We would have just said, oh, if you have heteroscopicity, just do all of us, it's fine, and we'd have moved on. So we want to explain why all of us is not fine. But uh, let's see what the properties are. And again, this is something we, we talked about the first day, uh, but maybe it wasn't as clear as it, as it could be, so hopefully we'll reinforce that today. So let's suppose, just as an example, that this is our, this is, this is a, the problem we face. We have that sort of heteroscedasticity. And um, let me be a little more careful here as I draw this. I want the dis distance to be symmetric. I want to have symmetric and unscedasticity. I, I don't want any skewness in the distribution of the, of the errors. So, so as long as this is the case, all of these errors 
are still centered on, even though they have a bigger variance, they're still, I don't mean a peak, it should be a little more rounded if the peak's there. I was just trying to hit the line. Um, they're all centered on the right value. So OLS is still going to be unbiased. We fit a line to this, we basically fit a line. Remember we said the first day, okay, we pick a bunch of X's. These are the XI's. And then we do an experiment, we get a bunch of distribute a bunch of observations here. So we mix A and B and see what happens. We do it two of A and one of B, ten of A, one of B, something like that. We do it a bunch of different times, observe the outcome, and then try to figure out the average response. Well, the averages are fine, so we're going to fit the line fine. The line is not going to have a bias problem. It's going to have an efficiency problem. So what we can say is that first, OLS is still unbiased and consistent. It's not that the center of the distribution is in the wrong place, it's their spread that's the problem. It's not the location. Location, location, location. Well, that's fine. But the neighbors are a lot noisier here than here. That's not fine. So it's the variance. So all that is still unbiased and consistent. Okay, now we need to take a time out for a second and ask, is that a familiar term? What's the difference between unbiasedness and consistent? for an estimator. That's what I thought. So you haven't seen consistency before? Okay, it's going to come up again and again, so I'm going to take a moment to explain the difference between bias and consistency, or inconsistency. One is a small sample property, unbiasedness. So one tells you about the estimator for a given sample size, even, even a small sample. The other, and that's bias, the other tells you what happens as n goes to infinity. So, let's save some words and do this in pictures initially. What unbiasedness tells you, suppose we're looking at the distribution of beta half. And this is just the frequency distribution, the distribution of, of the beta halves. We do the experiment over and over and over, and this, these are the beta halves we get. Now, now the truth is out there, and let's just find it. There it is. That's the beta we want. That's the true beta. This is the distribution of our estimator, which I haven't drawn yet. Unbiasedness simply says, for a given n, for a given sample size, it's centered on the true value. Efficiency says the variance is as small as it could possibly get, but unbiasedness, which is all we're dealing with here, lets us know that if this is the truth, this thing is centered, as best as I can draw it, on the true value. And that's what we mean by unbiasedness. And it, the n could be 11, and it's still centered on the right value. So this, this is for a given n, and we say it's a small sample property. You'll see why it is. Now what happens is n grows, which is not important for unbiasedness, but these distributions tend to get tighter and tighter as you get bigger n's. But they're always centered on the true value. And as n goes to infinity, you'll just collapse to the line. If you have an infinite amount of data, you'll get the truth. And so as we collect more and more data, the distribution gets tighter and tighter and tighter. But for a given n, it's, it's what it is. And that's what we care about. Now a consistent estimator is one that only gives you the truth as n approaches infinity. Let's suppose that beta hat, or 
how do I want to do this? Um, yeah, let's do this one. Let's suppose that your estimator is the truth plus 1 over n, the expected value of your estimator is that. This estimator is biased in small samples. If I look at the distribution for say n equals 10, what's going to happen? It's going to be centered on beta plus 1 10. It's not going to be centered on the truth. So this estimator could look like this. There's the center of, that's the expected value of beta half. And that's the truth. That estimator in small samples is not OK. And the smaller the end, the worse the problem. Now, this is the simplest way you can do consistency. This could be all kinds of different functions. What's important, though, is what happens as n goes to infinity. This goes to 0. And the estimator converges to the true value. So instead of talking about unexpected values, what we say is that the p limb of beta hat is equal to beta. It's called a probability limit. And that's how we evaluate consistency. You can use standard limit arguments to do it if you've had mathematics. We're not going to go through that. I just want to give you a, a general notion of consistency versus unbiasedness. Anyone who goes on will we'll see this notion when you get to grad school and the like, so I need to talk about it. But we're not going to do the underlying mathematics because this, this is a bit hard. But you just would take the limit of beta hat. And you oh, the limit of this is n goes to infinity is 0. And the limit of this is that. And you're, you're done. So it's a standard mathematical limiting argument that's always involved. But uh, anyway. So over time, what will happen is as n goes to infinity, this distribution will, will get tighter and tighter and move closer and closer. Until at the limit, you're going to be um, at the true value. Now what we hope is, that what we say here is just a large sample property. So we're, we rely upon the fact that for, for n large enough, we're close enough not to worry about it. So if we have 10,000 observations, I'm one ten thousandth off. That's such a small error that we just sort of don't worry about it. We assume, OK, we're so close with a big enough n that, that, that we're fine. And so often we have to rely upon consistency rather than biasness. And we'll see this quite a bit, where we only have consistency, but, but the, the estimator is biased in small samples. So uh, unbiased means unbiased or any n. Consistent just means unbiased at n equals infinity. It means you get the true value. I shouldn't use the unbiased term in the definition of consistency. It means you get the true value when n equals infinity. And that, that's it. So this could be 1 over n squared, 1 over square root n. If it's 1 over square root n, we converge slower than if it's 1 over n squared. So there's a rate of convergence that you can get out of these problems. Once you know the rate of convergence, you get some idea of how big an n has to be. And so you can look at these theoretically, get some notion of the rate of convergence of beta half to beta, and that gives you at least some idea of when your n's big enough not to worry about it. And a lot of micro data sets have you know, 10, 20, 30, 100,000 observations or even census data or something. When you have that many pieces of data, you can often rely upon consistency. But if I'm using annual data since 1982 when the, when the monetary policy procedure changed, I don't have very many observations. What, I have 28, 29, 30, somewhere in that range. You've got about 30 observations. That's probably not enough to rely upon consistency as a property of my estimator. In that case, I want unbiasedness, because I don't have an n that's big enough to rely upon consistency as a property. And so it depends upon the nature of the problem and all sorts of things. But, but often, again, we only have consistency. In this case, we're all right. We got both. By the way, unbiasedness implies consistency because if it's unbiased at all in, it has to be consistent because it'll be unbiased at n equals infinity. But consistency does not imply unbiased. So once you've established it's unbiased, you don't have to take the consistency step. 
Consistency only comes into play when you don't have unbiasedness and you still want to go ahead with your idea. And so you find a consistent estimator, which are often all maximum likelihood estimators, which we haven't done, are always consistent. But they're, they're not necessarily unbiased. And you can always get the maximum likelihood estimator for a problem if you know the distribution. So there's always a consistent estimator available to you once you know enough about these problems. We'll do maximum likelihood at the very last day of class. So it's, I don't expect you to fully comprehend what I just said. The point is that there's always a consistent estimator available to the econometrician. And that's why it's an important property and one I thought I had to introduce to you. Okay. Um, so that was all in this problem. Secondly, beta hat is not efficient. That is the variance of beta hat is biased. I lost track. Five. Five. Thank you. <laughs> biased and inefficient. The beta hat's not efficient because its variance is too big or too small. You don't have the right variance for beta hat. We're jumping ahead of ourselves a little bit here. But the reason is pretty simple. The variance of beta hat that you all learned for OLS is the is sigma squared over the sum of the xi squared. Where, where this is xi minus x bar. That's supposed to be a little xi. You, you can write it that way if you want. But that's the variance you learned from OLS. But when there's heteroscasticity, the true variance of beta hat turns out to be the sum of the xi squared sigma i squared over the sum of the xi squared quantity squared. So when you apply the standard OLS estimator, you get the wrong variance. That means it's not efficient. The reason is pretty simple. I mean, look at this assumption. You assume the variance is the same everywhere, but it's not. So you can't get the right answer. This estimator recognizes that it's different. And what we're going to talk about later is it weights them appropriately. So what this is doing is it's taking this sigma squared, and it's actually replacing it with the sum of the xi squared sigma i over the sum of the xi squareds. When you multiply that together, you get the squared squared. So it's replacing this with that. So it's, it's both recognizing that you have a different variance everywhere, and it's reweighting the variance depending upon the spread of the x's. When x's are, way, are spread way out, you get less weight than when the errors are tight. So what this is doing essentially is giving more weight to the tighter observations than it's giving to the ones with a lot of spread. The ones with a lot of spread, this is xi minus x bar squared. When you're long ways from the mean, you downweight that particular observation. When you're close to the mean, you upweight it. Say that xi is really close to x bar, so this difference is only 0.01. Well, then you're getting 100 times this. So it's upweighting it when they're close, and it's downweighting them when they're far away, essentially. And so it's giving more weight to the observations that tell us more about the problem and less weight to the ones that don't, which is, which is what you should do when you try to do these estimators. But, the, but anyway, so, so the darn thing's biased. What that means 
unfortunately, is that all your T's and F's and chi-squares and whatever other statistics you care to derive are wrong. So since 3, since the variance of beta hat is biased, T equals beta hat minus the hypothesized beta, call it beta, that, beta zero, over um, the square root of the variance of beta hat, that's how you get a T statistic. That's wrong. Because this term is wrong. That's what we just showed. The variance of beta hat, use OLS, is wrong. You've got a wrong variance when you take T, when you form a T, you get a wrong T. I've got the wrong T, I make the wrong decisions. And that's not what we want to do. We want to make the right decisions. So this is a problem. Forecasts are similarly affected. I'm not going to do much on the forecasting side of things. But were we to forecast, we'd have a similar problem. It's not the most efficient way to forecast using OLS. We'd want to use some other estimator. When we're forecasting, we don't want to give a lot of weight to the observations that have a lot of variance. We want to hone in on the ones that tell us a lot about the problem. And so we want to use a, an estimator that gives more weight to the tighter distributed observations. You know, just to make sure. What I'm saying is that we've got this data, and we can look at these data out here that are very spread out, or we can look at these data which are very tight. What we're doing is getting these things, when we do the estimator right, we want to pay a lot more attention to these than to these. OLS gives equal weight. That's not good. So this is essentially a way of reweighting. But this isn't the estimator itself. The same reweighting term appears in the estimator itself. We want to take beta hat and also adjust it so it pays more attention to some observations than others. And we'll, we'll, we'll do that. Okay. Good, 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 good. Testing. This is what your homework is largely about, so I'm going to get to this section. Though I've got Thursday, I guess. Testing. So you know, if we're going to get wrong answers in the presence of heteroplasticity, it'd be very, very useful if we knew when we had it. So that's what the tests are for. Then it'll be useful if we know when we have it, how to correct it next time. First thing you ought to do, this is only suggesting, this is not a formal test, but it can be very useful, but it's helpful. Graph u hat t squared. Take your estimated errors, which in e views is resid. It's an automatic variable. You run a regression, and resid just gets put in the data automatically. You would say resid r e s e d i s q equals resid star resid. That gives you resid squared inside the e views. This is the stuff they're going to show you how to do in lab. I'll do some of it on Thursday, too, I think. Um, and then suppose you, you, you have income or something like that. What you want to plot is u hat squared against the variable suspected of causing the, the, suspected of causing the problem. This says the variable. You're not going to read the variable suspected of causing the problem. If Remember my consumption income example? We think the variance expands with income. So we would graph this against income. If there's no heteroscedasticity, what should we see? The data ought to be fairly constant. It ought to be 
relatively horizontal. There's no relationship between ut squared and the y. But if there's a problem, if the variance, say, gets bigger as y gets bigger, my data will look like this. And it'll look like an upward sloping line. I'll see the heteroscedasticity in the data. I'll see the data. Ut squared is getting larger and larger and larger as yt goes up. And that's a good way to see it. When you, once you see this, you're pretty sure you, get, you still need to do the formal tests. Because you know, data can fool you. But you're pretty sure you have it if you can see a strong pattern between a strong relationship between the squares and the variables. Now, this might confuse you. I probably should have written income here instead of y, because you're going to look at your data. Your, I just realized this. You can look at your notes later and think I mean y in regressions and not y as income. So let me rewrite this as income, just to avoid that confusion later when, you, when you're looking at your notes. That's my fault. That's my poorly designed lecture, but uh, at least we caught it. Sorry, you had to be race. <laughs> Is that a two-year period of time series? Do you have heteroscedasticity in time series data? You can. Have. Question is, can you have heteroscedasticity in time series data? You can. Generally, it's more of a problem in cross-sectional data. So if I trace the same household over time and they get wealthier, the variance of their consumption might change. But if I'm looking at a bunch of people and following them over time, and the distribution of people, we don't have any quality changing or anything like that, the distribution of people stays the same, it's likely that in that time series I'm not going to see any heteroscedasticity. But at any point in time, if I look in the cross-section, I will see it. And so it's much more of a problem in cross-sectional than time series, but it's not absent from time series data. We'll have a test at the end of this chapter called ARCH tests. They're really easy. It's called autoregressive conditional heteroscedasticity, and it's a way of finding um, heteroscedasticity in time series data. So it is best if you think of this mostly as cross-section for the moment, even though some of my examples have been time series examples. In your example with income and uh, z squared, can it be downward sloping? It could. Okay. I wouldn't expect in this case it would be, but with some other variable, it very well could be. Especially if, if you have yi equals beta 1 plus beta 2. And your model suggests this should be 1 over xi plus pi, and this is a scale variable for whatever reason. It's going to work in exactly the opposite direction. Well, I don't know. We'd have to think about it. But depending, you know, so this is getting smaller and smaller. And then it's entirely possible this could happen. So yeah, there's no necessary. And this, I mean, even if your errors are like this, if you have a problem. And this might happen from a specification error rather than a scale variable. So that I've tried to estimate a quadratic process with a linear line, so I get small, big, and my data sort of goes from there to there. I get small, big, small. That's indicative of some specification error. But the point is when I see these plots, anything other than just sort of a horizontal spread if there's any discernible pattern, you probably have a heteroscedasticity problem. And the pattern itself is revealing as to what type of problem you might have, which is, I think is, is what you're saying. Cool. Uh, OK, uh, OK, what? So let's, yeah. OK, let's do, since you bothered to show up today, the good news is none of this we're going to do for the next probably I don't know. None of this is in your book. This is one of those cases where I think the book's entirely too simplistic. So we're just going to do what we need to do to do it right. So we're going to start off with, a, with three what we call Lagrange multiplier tests, which are the modern way of doing tests for heteroscedasticity. Then we're going to conclude with a very simple push-button test 
It's in your package that you can use called White's Test. So the simplest test is White's Test. It's, it, well, I won't tell you the conclusions yet. You're not ready for them. Let's just go through it. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is Lagrange. You're not going to actually see any Lagrange multipliers. So don't worry about that. Tests. Or heteroscedasticity. These are called LM tests. And we like them because they're robust against distributional um, misspecifications. If we assume normal and the actual errors are something else, this test still performs pretty well. So it performs pretty well in the presence of specification errors, which is important. There are other tests that are better if your model's correctly specified, but they're worse if it's not. And so that's actually the point that applies to the white test too. But anyway, so we like these tests because they're fairly robust. They're not perfect, but they're fairly robust. And I'll have more to say about that. So let's let um, yi is beta 1 plus beta 2 x 2i plus, plus beta to k x ki plus ei. Or we've been using, I've been using ei all day. I probably used ui last time. Just an error. Just a letter. No biggie. And the variance of EI is sigma I squared. So there, there's heteroscedasticity. It depends upon I. So suppose I have N observations. So let's suppose we have N observations. How many parameters are there to estimate in this model? How many betas? Usually you have one variance to estimate. So how many things do you have to estimate? K plus one. When you include the variance, which is something you have to estimate in these problems to get T statistics and things. And if you have N greater than K plus one, no problem. We've got enough observations. How many variances are there here? I goes from one to N. So how many sigmas are there? There's N of them. Break some more chunk. Okay, so how many sigma i squares are there to estimate? The answer is n. So what's the total parameters? n plus k. How many pieces of data do you have? So, but only n obs, so it's infeasible. There's no possible way to estimate more than n things with only n observations. You need at least one observation for each thing you're trying to estimate. kind of a simplistic example. X plus Y equals 1. What are X and Y? I can't get two things out of one piece of data. I can't uniquely get X and Y from one piece of data. X plus Y equals 1. X minus Y equals 11. 
x and y determine. Two pieces of data, two things to estimate. But any, either one of the observations alone is not enough to determine x plus y. In a general sense, you cannot ever get, you know, I can't control two lights with one light switch. I can't get two things out of one piece of data. So there's no way to do this. I can't estimate every single variance and every single parameter. So I have to reduce the scope of my problem somehow. I have to somehow reduce the problem estimating n plus k variables to a feasible problem of estimating something less than n. I cannot estimate that many things. So what we're going to do is we're going to parameterize the variance. We're going to write down a model of the variance that reduces the number of parameters. We're going to have four different models of the variance. Um, yeah. We'll have four different models of the variance. I'm not going to do it. Okay. Um, so let's give me, let me give you the simplest possible way to do this. So I'm going to take the problem of estimating n variances and reduce it to the problem of estimating just one. Suppose that the variance, suppose, and it may or may not follow this process, but the variance can be modeled as sigma i squared equals sigma squared times x i squared. Think of this just as a parameter. Maybe if I, you can think of this as just alpha if you want. So sigma i squared is alpha x i squared. I know the x's. Maybe this is x4 or something. So one of those, this is a scale variable. And what this does is it lets the variance expand with x. And so this is a good way to model heteroscedasticity when I have a scale variable. Because if this is income, my variance is expanding with a scale, with a spread, uh, what I'm looking for is square, with the square of the variance. But now if I know alpha or sigma squared, if I know that one parameter, I know all n variances. All I have to estimate is, it might be better to call this alpha so you, you understand it's just a parameter. Sigma squared is just a parameter. If I know alpha, I know the x's, that's just my data, so I know all the variances. So now I only have one thing to estimate. You missed that one, I just broke another one. Um, only one thing to estimate. So I only have k plus one parameters. Now it's feasible again. If k plus one is 11 and n is 100, I'm fine. And so by parameterizing the variance, we can reduce that problem to a simpler problem. We haven't talked about how to estimate this yet. This is just at a theoretical level so you know what the issues are. We'll get there. We'll, we'll use these models to estimate this alpha later. But right now, we're going to use these models to come up with tests of heteroscedasticity. Okay. okay? All right. Now, that model is probably not flexible enough to capture all the kinds of heteroscedasticity that are out there. This does a good job of capturing scale heteroscedasticity. But if I had other types, this doesn't do a very good job. So I want to come up with more general models that I can use that reduce the number of parameters to estimate so it's still feasible, but yet give me something flexible enough to model the variance adequately. OK? So we're going to use three alternatives. <coughs> First is called Bruch, that's an S right there, Hagen. 
So this one says that sigma i squared is equal to Now the z's here are just some known variables, and they're often the x's, but they may not be the x's in our model. So I'm going to use z's, but the z's, you can think of them just as the x's, some of the x's, S-O-M-E, some of the x's. But it could be different from the x's too. So I'm going to say sigma i squared is equal to um, alpha 1 plus alpha 2 z 2i plus alpha p z pi. And again, these could be x's. This could be income, this could be interest rates, you know, whatever's in our model. But they don't have to be the same x's in our models. I'm giving them new names. Okay. There's another one called G-L-E-J-S-E-R, which I don't know how to say. <laughs> Here we're going to say sigma i. Instead of square, it's just sigma. Then the rest is the same. Alpha 1 plus alpha 2 z 2i plus alpha p z pi. Then we have the park model. Sometimes called the Harvey Godfrey test. I don't care about these names. You don't need to know the names. I forget them. Figure if I don't know them, I can't very well make you know them. But I do know the logs. The log of sigma i squared is alpha 1 plus alpha 2 z 2i plus alpha p z pi. So there, in these models, there's going to be k betas, and there'll be p alphas. So we'll have k plus p parameters to estimate. Is that the measure one? Is it supposed to be uh, sigma squared? No, it's not. And that's what I want to talk about next. So, we, we've got, oops. This has to be less than n still. We hope by some margins we have a deep, lots of degrees of freedom. We need enough degrees of freedom. That has to be true. When, when this was n, it couldn't possibly be true. So we've taken the problem of estimating n things and reduced it to a problem of estimating p things, which now makes it feasible. We just estimate these alphas along with the betas. We've got the variances. Once we know the alphas, these z's are data that we know. They're in our spreadsheet. These are just our x's most of the time. So once we know the alphas, we will learn how to estimate those. We'll just do a regression, take resid squared, say here, regress it on the x's. If we regress resid squared on the x's, we'll get the alphas. It's going to be that simple when we actually estimate this. So your first step was you'll, you'll do OLS, you'll save the residuals, you'll square the residuals, and you'll estimate the residuals on the z's, that gives you the alphas. Then we'll use this to correct the OLS estimator, but we're ahead of ourselves. For now, we're just testing. Now, in each case, how many restrictions are needed? I forgot to say one thing I wanted to say, but let me, let me do this. To get a constant variance. How do I turn this into a constant variance? I just want the alpha 1 term. Alpha 1, you can think of as, if all the other alphas were 0 here, sigma i squared is sigma squared. It's constant. It's alpha 1. So in each case, if alpha 2, the null is alpha 2 equals alpha 3 equals alpha p equals 0, how many are those? Well, there's one missing. There's p of them. So this P minus 1 restrictions. So what we're going to do is end up doing a chi-square test with P minus 1 restrictions. 
And the test itself is just, the statistic is going to be n times r squared. That's why LM tests are so easy. You run a regression, you take nr squared, that's your test statistic. You look up the chi squared with p minus 1, you're done. So this will be not too hard. Let's use this as our first example. But let me back up for a second and explain why we have three different models, which is something I didn't do yet. Suppose you have a case where around your regression model, it appears like the data expands linearly around. So it's not a nonlinear. The variance is expanding linearly with x. And this is a good model because the variance is a linear function of x. In this model, to get sigma squared, I have to square this whole thing. So in, in this model, sigma squared is a function just of the z's. In this model, sigma squared is basically a function of the z squareds. Because if I square this, I, I get the individual terms too, but basically you have all the cross products and all the square terms. What that means is the variance is increasing with the square of x. And so the variance is going to expand faster. And so if you've got linear expansion, use this. If you think you've got an even faster expansion than that, use this. This is, if I unlog it, it says sigma i squared is e to the alpha 1 plus alpha 2 z2 plus alpha p zp. This is exponential. This increases even faster, or you get an exponential decay too. So this increases as, at, at a rate of a square. This can in, increase exponentially. So you have three different, and, and it can decline exponentially as well. You can have exponential decay or exponential growth. If this is negative, you'll get exponential decay. And if it's positive, you'll get e to the infinity is infinity. And this, this is how you do um, exponential growth rates. So things expand even faster than square. Probably more like I've drawn it here. So they, they, if, if, the, if the variance is not expanding very fast, that's good. You think for some reason it's expanding to the square, that's good. The you know, more general expansion, this, and this kind of includes that as a special case. Because exponential, you, you can mimic through exponential, you can, you can mimic square expansions fairly well. So, th you know, this is, this is probably one that comes up a lot. People use this, they, they use them all. It just depends upon, you have to think about the underlying theory and ask yourself which test, uh, which model of the variance would be most appropriate for the problem I have. And partly that can, you can get that from those graphs we did at the beginning. You can look at those graphs. Oh, that looks pretty linear. That looks pretty nonlinear. And that will help you determine which model to use. Whew. Okay. Oops. One last thing. How do I test for it? In each of those three cases, you need an estimate. The first case, you need an estimate of sigma squared. In the second case, you need an estimate of sigma. And in the third case, you need an estimate of the log of sigma. Because those were our three models. Did I write log of sigma or the log of sigma squared when I wrote that down a minute ago? It should be sigma squared. The, the mistakes of my notes. This is squared. For this model, our estimate of it, so we estimate by u hat i squared. So the way we estimate the sigma i squared is just square the residuals. This is just resid squared. For this one, the way we estimate it is by the absolute value uh, so you say abs resid equals abs resid in the program. Because errors are going to be positive and negative, but variances have to be positive. But the negative value should tell you about the spread. 
And so we just take the absolute value. To estimate this one, we just use the log of u hat squared. So here's the steps for the LM test. This is what your homework's about. I'm going to do case one first, and I'm going to do case two and three next time because your homework's case one. So case one is this model. It's the uh, what I call the uh, very first one. There. I told you I forget their names. The Bruce Pagan. So I'm going to. Th this is case one as I wrote them down. So I'm going to do case Okay, one. Here's the cookbook. Regress y on x1 up to xk. That's the constant up to xk. On a constant on all the x's, you'll get theta hat OLS. Two, and the computer does this for you automatically, compute u hat t equals y minus beta 1 hat minus beta 2 hat x2 minus beta k hat xk. So run the regression, save the residuals. That's all we've done so far. Three, one. There's a 3, 2, and a 3, 3 in my notes. I'll do those next time. 3, 1 is square u hat t to get u hat t squared. So you save the, the residuals here. Now you square them. In the other cases, you compute the absolute value of the log. It's really simple. Okay, regress. U hat t squared on z1, which is the constant, up to zp. You with me? You got it one minute or less. Run the regression, save the residuals, square them, run the residuals on the z's. And I'll do this next time on the computer, any of you to show you. At the, at the latest on Tuesday. Okay, finally, compute the statistic, the LM stat is equal to N times R squared. And that's literally the number of observations times the R squared on the printout. And a lot of printouts give you this data. They actually compute the R squared for you. Then, the LM stat is chi squared with p minus 1 degrees of freedom. So you just compare the stat to the, to the, so the last step is compare to critical value and either accept or reject the null. What was the null? So I wrote that fast. Compare the critical value, accept or reject the null, and the null, remember, was constant variance. Alpha 2 equals alpha 3 equals alpha 3. So the way to test for constant variance, run the regression, save the residuals, square them, run them on the z's, Compute nr squared, that's chi squared to p minus 1, to either reject or accept that you have a constant variance. That's it. It's not hard. 20 seconds over, my apologies. Thank you for not getting all excited at the end and, and running out and making. I'll try to end on time.